Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So the safety of all Americans is the Biden-Harris administration's first priority as the security situation in Lebanon becomes increasingly volatile. I want to take a moment to talk about the numerous steps the Biden-Harris administration is taking to support Americans who seek to depart or relocate within Lebanon. We are working around the clock to help Americans in Lebanon by providing as many options as possible to depart and offering loans to U.S. citizens who need assistance. Since September 27th, the United States has secured more than 4,000 airplane, airplane seats for American citizens, lawful permanent residents, and their family members to depart Lebanon. We have reserved seats for Americans and their family members on daily commercial airlines that continue to fly out of Beirut, and we have organized additional flights for U.S. citizens, lawful permanent residents, and their spouses, children, and parents to depart Lebanon. As long as the Beirut airport remains open, we will continue to make more airplane seats available daily. To date, the number of seats available continues to exceed demand. The U.S. Embassy in Beirut remains open and can help Americans who need emergency passports or other documentation. We urge Americans to take advantage of these options. Ultimately, a diplomatic resolution is the only way to achieve lasting stability and security across the Israel-Lebanon Israel border. We are in discussions for when we will be able to achieve that. Now, earlier today, as many of you saw, the President and the Vice President received an update regarding Hurricane Helene response and recovery efforts. Under their leadership, FEMA has provided $344 million in direct assistance to survivors, along with an additional $180 million to ensure our federal partners can carry out their critical recovery work. More than 8,000 federal personnel are deployed, including FEMA disaster survivor assistant teams that are in the neighborhood, in, the, in neighborhoods across the affected states, helping survivors apply for assistance. These personnel across the Southeast, including Florida, will both continue Hurricane Helene recovery efforts and respond to the impacts of Hurricane Milton. As the President has said, we will be there for the communities devastated by the storm for as long as it takes. The President and the Vice President received a briefing on the administration's life-saving preparations ahead of Hurricane Milton. The President uh, continues to mobilize a whole of government effort to prepare for Hurricane Milton. Earlier this week, the president quickly approved the state of Florida, Florida's and the and the and the Seminole tribe of Florida's request for an emergency declaration pre-Milton landfall. He directed his team to keep working to increase the size and presence of our efforts as we prepare for Milton's landfall. The president spoke directly to Governor DeSantis, Tampa Mayor Castor, Clearwater Mayor Rector, and Pinellas County Chairwoman Peters to make sure we are meeting their needs and gave them his personal number so they can call him directly. As the president's, at the president's direction, the administration has been in touch with more than 60 local officials in cities and counties along the likely path of impact to ensure needs are met in advance of the storm. The president gathered his cabinet representing 16 agencies and departments to ensure every corner of the U.S. government is assisting with Helene recovery and preparations for Milton. And at the president's direction, FEMA administration, Administrator Criswell will travel to Florida tonight to join the, pers the personnel on the ground and ensure every Floridian gets the help that they need. FEMA is pre-staging a full slate of response capabilities in Florida and the region, including eight urban search and rescue teams, three U.S. Coast Guard swift water rescue teams, 15.6 million meals, 13.9 million liters of water already pre-positioned, an additional 20 million meals and 40 million liters of water ready to deploy as needed. More than 1,000 staff already in the region. And as the president and the vice president have said, any attempts to price gouge Americans, whether at the gas pumps, airport, or hotel counter during this storm are unacceptable. 
The Justice Department, FTC, and Consumer Financial Protection Bureau put out a statement warning consumers about those looking to take advantage of natural disasters. The administration will also continue to work out, to, to work out and call out misinformation and conspiracy theories around the storm and federal and state responses. This is wrong, dangerous, and it must stop immediately. You heard the president speak to this just moments ago. Everyone, especially those in positions of power, must do everything they can to encourage survivors to register for assistance, not discourage them by allowing these falsehoods to fester. This storm will be catastrophic. It will be catastrophic. We urge everyone to listen to local officials, and if you are told to evacuate, do so. Please do so immediately. If you can't evacuate or need a safe place to shelter, text SHELTER and your zip code to 43362 to get a list of open shelters near you. With that, I will turn it over to Administrator Criswell, who is joining us uh, virtually. Thank you so much, Administrator. I know you are incredibly busy today, but thank you for your time. And with that, I'm gonna just turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much, Corrine. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. As you just heard from Corrine, um, I just had an opportunity to brief uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris on our preparatory actions as we uh, prepare for Hurricane Milton to make landfall in Florida. Uh, the entire federal family is leaning forward uh, for Milton's uh, response. And right now I am in North Carolina continuing to lead the response and recovery efforts for the impacts to Helene across many states. Um, but I will be traveling uh, this evening to Florida to be with the uh, team that I have there on the ground as well as meet with the governor and his team to make sure that we are working side by side to meet the needs of Floridians as Hurricane Milton passes through the state. I want to deliver a very important message to the people of Florida. This is going to be a catastrophic storm. It is going to be a potentially deadly storm. Please listen to your local officials as they will be giving you the best information about what you need to do where you are located. This storm is going to bring deadly storm surge, intense winds, flooding, but it is already bringing tornadoes across Florida. So if you do get an emergency message on your phone right now for a tornado warning, please seek shelter immediately. My heart goes out to all of the Floridians who have been in the path of many storms. They have had impacts from Hurricane Ian, Hurricane Debbie, Hurricane Idalia, and now Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton. Floridians, they're no strangers to these storms, but this one, Hurricane Milton, it is expected to be catastrophic. And I promise you that FEMA is ready. FEMA and the entire federal family will be there to provide those immediate life-saving activities and begin to stabilize the incident after the storm passes. And again, I will be there on the ground to assess the impacts and prioritize the movement of federal resources to where the state needs them most. Today, tonight, and tomorrow, these are going to be tough as we watch the impacts move across Florida. And again, we're already seeing impacts from this storm with tornadoes and high winds happening in different parts of Florida. The most important thing is your safety. And I need everyone listening to do everything you can to protect yourself and your family as Milton passes. Some of you may still be able to safely evacuate. Others, it may be too late. Again, I need you to listen to your local officials. They will know exactly what you are still able to do. And if you receive, again, a tornado warning on your phone, through a NOAA radio, or from your local officials, there are tornadoes that are happening now. You need to seek shelter immediately. I have also been in contact with Governor DeSantis, Mayor Castor, Mayor Welch, and Mayor Dyer, as well as all the tribal nations in Florida that are in the path of this storm. 
The president's swift approval of the pre-landfall emergency declaration for Florida, as well as the uh, Seminole Tribe of Florida, allows us to be able to employ the resources that we have staged to immediately begin to save lives and support the response activities. In addition to the thousands of people that I already have on the ground in Florida for Hurricane Helene, as well as the previous storms from previous years, at the president's direction, I sent an additional 1,200 search and rescue personnel, six incident management assistance teams, multiple power assessment teams, and dozens of medical facility assessment personnel into the area pre-landfall. We've also staged over 500 ambulances, and the search and rescue teams include high water vehicles and air assets, as well as boats, to support those life-saving activities in the first hours after the storm passes. As you heard Corrine say, we've also pushed millions of meals and liters of water into Florida to support those immediate needs. And let me be clear, the movement of these resources and these commodities are not taking away from our ongoing response and recovery efforts in North Carolina and the other states that were impacted by Hurricane Helene. We are built for this. We have managed multiple simultaneous catastrophic incidents before, and we are prepared to do this again. And I want the people to hear it from me. FEMA is ready. Our agency is postured to respond to this storm and maintain our current response and recovery efforts for Hurricane Helene impacted states. And we will be providing and I will be providing regular updates to President Biden and Vice President Harris as this storm passes so we can make sure that we are getting all of the federal resources that are needed to support their response. And they have directed me, as they always do, to make sure that Floridians continue to get everything they need. I want to be clear, we at FEMA stand ready to both continue our support to Hurricane Helene and respond to the impacts from Hurricane Milton. This is what we do best. We manage complex incidents. We coordinate, we communicate, and we respond. And again, I'll be traveling to Florida later today so I can join my team as well as our state partners that are in the field preparing for the impacts from Hurricane Latine. Uh, my leadership team, they are the best of the best. They are trained to work across multiple states and support the impacts that states are going to be feeling. And I want, to know, want everybody to know that we are prepared for what we need to do to support Florida as well as all of the other states. Before I take questions, I just want to emphasize once again, because this is extremely important. People need to listen to their local officials. They need to take this storm seriously. It's going to hit the west coast of Florida as a major hurricane, and it will still be a hurricane as it departs on the eastern coast of Florida. There will be flooding, there will be tornadoes, storm surge. Take the actions you need to, to protect yourself and your family. We do not need to lose any lives as a result of this storm. We have the time to prepare. Make sure that you're taking those actions now. And with that, Corrine, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Administrator. I just want to remind folks that she can only hear us, can't see us. Uh, so I'm going to start calling on folks uh, right now. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you uh, making this time. Um, do you have an estimate of the universe of how many people are not heeding uh, the evacuation orders and remain at risk? Uh, I do not have an estimate, but what I can tell you is that I was in Florida on Monday. I met with the mayor of Tampa and the mayor of St. Petersburg, and I saw people leaving the area. People are listening. They are leaving. But we know there's always a few um, that want to stay behind and protect their home. This storm is different. This storm is gonna bring deadly storm surge. And so I want people who still have time to evacuate to make sure that they're doing so, but doing so safely under the guidance and the advice of their local officials. Go ahead, MJ. Thank you, Administrator. This is MJ Lee with CNN. Um, the White House has been talking a lot about uh, the threat of misinformation, disinformation as it relates to storm recovery efforts. Um, can you uh, talk to us about uh, whether there's one piece of incorrect information that you think, in your view, has been most damaging that you think would be most important to clarify? 
Well, honestly, I think all of it is uh, damaging to our ability to be able to reach people. Uh, it's intentional to create distrust, and that level of distrust is, as the president said earlier today, un-American. And what we need to do is make sure people can get the assistance that they need and they deserve. And so I want people to be able to come to us, register for assistance, so we can help them on their road to recovery. Go ahead, Nandita. Thank you. Uh, Administrator, you have said that FEMA has enough money uh, to get through both hurricanes, Helene and Milton, but that you're assessing how much more you need from Congress. Is there an assessment that you can share with us? Uh, we're continuing to make that assessment as we do not know what it's going to cost us right now to get through Hurricane Milton. I think as I've briefed all of you before, uh, we went into immediate needs funding uh, in August of this year. That allowed me to make sure I had enough money uh, for this response and I needed that for Hurricane Helene. Without going into INF, I probably would not have had enough money to support Hurricane Helene. Um, with the full authority to spend against the president's fiscal year 25 budget, I've been able to start paying the recovery projects that we put on hold. But the, the amount that we're spending for Hurricane Helene and the amount that we anticipate we're going to spend for Hurricane Milton, we are watching that very closely and assessing it every day so we can have a good estimate of how much more that we will need to be asking for in a supplemental. Good, Selena. Thank you, Corrine. Thank you, Administrator Criswell. Selena Wayne with ABC News. Could you give any specific examples about the real world impact that this misinformation is having, both in terms of are you seeing people who aren't taking precautions because they don't trust the government or FEMA or NOAA, and then in terms of the threat to FEMA workers, have you seen examples of threats against them on the ground? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is that what I am hearing is people that are not uh, coming to us and asking us for assistance. They're not registering for the help that they need or they are afraid to approach some of our staff because they are unsure of what the government is doing. I think one of the biggest ones that I continue to hear is that we're going to take their land from them. Simply untrue. When you register for assistance, we give you an initial amount of money, $750, to help support those immediate needs. And there were rumors out there that if you, uh, you received this money and you didn't pay it back, that we would take your home. Simply untrue. This is a series of, of assistance that we give over time, those immediate needs. We've already given out over $60 million in North Carolina alone for people's property losses, as well as this immediate assistance. We will continue to give that money out. And as it relates to my staff, I mean, it's just demoralizing. I think that if they take it personally, they have left their families and their homes to come here and support people in need, but they're focused. They continue to stay focused on why they're here they know their purpose, and that is to help people, and we'll continue to do that. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you, Administrator. You said before that you have um, dealt with misinformation in the past. Why do you think that misinformation is so rampant this time around? Is it because of the election? Is it because of certain politicians? Is it become a, because of tech platforms? Or is it because of potentially a foreign actor? Yeah, I mean, I have definitely seen misinformation before. We have had misinformation uh, for you know a long time, but we have seen it increase recently. We saw a significant increase in the response in Maui and uh, even more, the greatest amount that I've seen uh, in this response to Hurricane Helene. You know, I don't want to speculate as to why we're seeing this increase. It's just damaging and it just makes it harder for us to do our job, and it's a distraction for the people that are out there doing really hard work to help the people get the assistance that they need and deserve. Ken? Uh, could you uh, just describe, the, the, the storm is going to be making landfall at, late at night on, on the West Coast. To what extent does that add to the complications or the dangers for residents, and, and just how unique is it the fact that it will be a hurricane when it hits the West Coast, but also a hurricane when it exits the East Coast of Florida? I think any time we see a storm hit uh, during the evening, it just complicates things, right? Because we know that we will have power outages as a result of this. It will be dark. People will have to uh, try to protect themselves without the same level of light uh, that they're used to. It just creates a whole other level of complication. Um, but as we heard from uh, Director Brennan earlier today, 
Uh, it is very rare for a storm to be a hurricane when it makes landfall and as it exits the state. It's going to move quickly, according to him, through the state, but that means it's going to create these catastrophic impacts uh, across the state. We're going to see the most significant with storm surge on the West Coast, but we know from Hurricane Ian how much inland flooding and flash flooding that happened on the East Coast in the Orlando area. And so we're concerned about that. And that's why I talked to the mayor of Orlando earlier today to make sure he knew that even though the West Coast is getting a lot of focus on this, that the East Coast is going to have significant threats as well. And that's why I've also got incident management teams right there in the Orlando area to help uh, work side by side with the local officials so we can get those resources in as quickly as possible when this storm is making landfall and moving across the state. And I know, Administrator, you have to head out. Akela, you have the last question. Okay. Hi, Administrator. I'm just wondering if the administration is confident that the election will still be able to be conducted by November, that power outages, that roads will be safe to drive on so voters can cast their ballot. Uh, so, you know, the election piece is with the states, and we have resources that we can help them with to ensure uh, we meet whatever needs that they have, and, and we'll continue to work with them if they have any specific requirements. Thank you so much, Administrator. Safe travels. Uh, I know Thanks, you've been in Carolina uh, for some time helping on the ground there. We really appreciate everything that you're doing, and safe travels to Florida tonight. Thanks, Thank Corrine. You. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Uh, Amr? Oh, great. Um, on uh, the Netanyahu call yeah. earlier today, was uh, the president um, told by Prime Minister Netanyahu how he intends to respond to Iran after the October 1 um, attack? And then secondly, um, the Prime Minister's office and uh, President Trump have confirmed they spoke last week. Was the White House informed of that call ahead of time? And do you know the contents of that call? And just generally, are yeah. you comfortable with that type of conversation happening? So look, a couple of things. You, you just asked me a, a slew of things there. I just I do want to say I know there's the rabbi call that the president's going to be doing momentarily. We'll let you know when that happens. I think we're running a little bit behind, and I know that uh, there's going to be an opportunity for all of you all to, to tune in. Let me just give you a couple of just um, top lines on the call. Uh, it lasted about 30 minutes. It was 30 minutes long. It was direct. Uh, it was productive, obviously the call that the president had with the Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, they discussed a range of issues, and we are going to have a, a readout shortly that uh, you all will, will have uh, to, to get a better sense of uh, what was discussed on the call, so I'm not going to get ahead of that. I know the team is, is working through that at, at this time. So as you all know, the U.S. and, and uh, the Israeli government have been discussing, have had discussion uh, since last week. Uh, after, um, uh, certainly since after the Iran attack. And so that those discussions continued uh, with the President and the Prime Minister. Um, certainly not going to get into those uh, discussions. Uh, there's going to be a readout. Don't have anything else beyond, beyond that to share. But I can say that they did have a discussion uh, about that. And it is a continued discussion. It started off with, obviously, staff-level discussion last week. And obviously, the two leaders had an opportunity uh, to, uh, to, to talk directly. Like I said, it was productive. It was direct. It lasted about 30 minutes. Uh, and this is on top of uh, more than a dozen calls that the pr President and the Prime Minister have had uh, since uh, October 7th of last year. Um, as it relates to your one of your questions there uh, about the the book. Look, as you know, there. Are, I'm oh, sorry, about, okay. About the Trump conversation oh. last week. Oh. Did I, did I ask about the book as well? Uh, but, we can uh, come back to the book. We can yeah. come back. There's plenty of questions. <laughs> I'd like to answer that as well. But uh, particularly okay. about Trump's conversation, I think that's more pertinent to today's. We'll call. say more about the Trump conversation. So Trump spoke with uh, Netanyahu oh, last I week. I see what you're saying. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay. <laughs> You, what are you guys um, aware of it? Anyway? Uh, look, I, I don't, I don't. That's something for obviously the Trump, the Trump team to speak to. I can't speak to that uh, about their conversation. I just don't have anything to well, add. I guess it's that. more relevant. Yeah. Are we having like two, two different, a former administration and the current administration doing foreign uh, policy at I the mean, same look, time? As you know, there's one, one president as a, at a time. That has been the way that we've done this, right, in this country, uh, uh, and so that is what exists. Uh, the president, the current president, the president Biden had a conversation 
conversation with the prime minister. Uh, they've had, as I mentioned, more than more than a dozen conversations since uh, the past uh, the past year, since uh, October seventh of twenty twenty three. And I think what you have seen from this administration uh, is the continued support uh, for Israel's security. You saw that over the past uh, cu past couple of days, obviously since the uh, past couple of weeks, uh, when Iran attacked Israel, the president directed his military uh, to protect uh, Israel. He was, was very proud to be able to do that. And that support continues. Uh, they had a, as I said, a direct, uh, a productive conversation, as they've had for many times. This is, when you think about the president and the, and the prime minister, they've known each other for decades, for decades. Uh, and so that's what I can speak to. I'm not going to get into uh, the former president and his conversation uh, with world leaders. And if I can just ask one about the book. Yep. Uh, Russia said today um, that the um, uh, COVID testing material that was uh, given to Putin by Trump was nothing abnormal. Back then, there was a lot of trading going on of material. Um, is that true? And then if it is yeah. true, well, why was the president um, going after Trump yesterday at the Casey fundraiser uh, over giving Putin uh, this material? I mean, look, that was a, a, a political event, so I'm going to let the president okay. speak to whatever he's, what he said uh, at that event. I'm not going to say be, go beyond that. Uh, what I will say is, when it, as it relates to what happened in the last administration, how then the president um, behaved and and what he uh, was able to you know to do whatever's being reported I'm going to leave it to the 2020 uh, that time in 2020 to that administration look what I can say and we can say very proudly and and forcefully I believe is how this president uh, responded to a once in a century pandemic uh, he put forth a comprehensive strategy to move forward to get shots in arms money in pockets at a time where the economy was at a tailspin and it this is a president that took that very, very seriously, along with a critical partnership that he had with the vice president. And that's why we've seen the economy turn around. That's why we all sitting here today without masks on, because the president actually took this seriously and made sure that we were able to get out of the pandemic. That's what I'm going to speak to. The president said what he he wanted to say uh, yesterday, and I'll leave it as that. But that it, I guess, are you, is it just adding to misinformation then? Because that what the president, the last president at that time, was doing what it sounds like he thought was the right thing. Everybody needed material at that time. I'm going to let the former president speak for himself and how he behaved and the actions that he took. That is for him to speak to. What I can speak to is what the president has done over the last three and a half years. And look, when we came into this administration, we did not have a comprehensive strategy to deal with COVID. That did not happen. I mean, you had a former president who was telling people to inject bleach to inject bleach. And you have this president and this vice president who took it very seriously and put forth a comprehensive strategy to deal with a once in a century pandemic. And the economy is now, uh, look, just looking at the data, the economy has turned around. We are leading with the economy worldly, globally. Uh, and, you know, we are in a different place. We are in a different place. And that is because of the leadership of this president. We all saw, we, you all, some of you were in this room when the former president would come to uh, the podium to talk about uh, the, uh, the pandemic and the lies that was spewing and what was happening. And this president took it seriously. That's what I can say. Go ahead, Gabe. Uh, thanks, Marie. Um, regarding the Woodward book um, and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, you said that, you, and you have referenced the dozen calls the president has had yeah. with more, the Prime Minister since the start of the war. Yeah. As it was brought up last time, he hadn't had one before this, before October, uh, excuse me, before August 21st. In the book, um, Woodward reports that the president used an expletive when referring to Netanyahu and calling him a bad guy and other disparaging remarks. What's the White House response to that? So I'll say first uh, that, look, there's going to be many books that are written about this administration uh, and many administration. It's, it's a typical thing. Uh, to, to occur. Nothing uh, atypical about that. I'm not going to weigh in on particulars in each one of those books. Uh, what I can say to that question that you asked me, I cannot confirm. That is not something that I can confirm from here. But does, does it speak to the relationship I, of President Biden and Biden? And this is what I've said moments ago, Gabe, which is this president and the prime minister have known each other for decades. And their conversations, their, their relationship have always been honest and direct. And this 30-minute conversation that they had today was also direct 
and very productive. And, you know, you, you have heard the president say he doesn't agree with everything, and they have disagreements. But because they have had this decade, decades-long uh, uh, relationship, they're able to be honest with each other. I think what matters here is that the, this administration, this president's commitment uh, to Israel security is iron is ironclad, and that will be continue, uh, certainly be, be continue to be the case. And quickly on another topic, on the reporting in that book that um, he, the former President Trump uh, spoke uh, with Vladimir Putin at least seven times since leaving office, is that appropriate? So look. We're not aware of those calls. Uh, I certainly can't confirm uh, any of those calls from here. Uh, but it if, but it, if it is indeed true, uh, are we concerns? Do we have serious concerns? Yes, if it is true. Again, I cannot confirm uh, any of those calls. Uh, let's not forget, it is concerning, especially uh, when we know uh, the former president was uh, lobbying against more aid for Ukraine, to Ukraine to defend themselves against Russia's aggression. So if true, it is concerning. Uh, but again, I want to be really clear, I cannot confirm any of these calls. But is it, how is it possible that the intelligence community wouldn't know that I a cannot, former president spoke with I, I hear you. I just cannot confirm it. those the calls happening. has not been briefed uh, I cannot confirm any of these calls, Richard. Given that the president canceled his foreign trip, he would have left, I think, tomorrow morning um, for Germany and Angola. Can you give us just a sense of what the next few days will look like as he is monitoring uh, Milton? Yeah. Will he be here the whole time, probably? Is it possible he'll go to Delaware over the weekend? Um, are you guys talking about a possible trip to Florida at some yeah. point already? So as you saw this morning, the president's going to continue to get hurricane uh, briefings, not just on Milton and how we're preparing and what's happening. Uh, obviously, we're all uh, certainly very much focused. He's going to be laser focused on that as well as the vice president. Uh, and so he'll continue to be updated, uh, continue to get those briefings. Uh, I don't have any travel to read out to you at this time, uh, whether it is to the impacted areas or outside of that. What I can say is the president is going to continue to uh, to uh, to to be laser focused on the storms and what's happening, the, pre the preparations, uh, how we are uh, still uh, certainly responding uh, to the immediate needs of uh, folks who have been impacted uh, by Hurricane Helene as well. That is also very much in 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 front of us and what we're trying to do and, and get done there. Uh, but that's going to be his focus. Uh, you're continue to hear more from the president. I can guarantee you that over the next couple of days. Uh, but what we want to share very, very clearly with uh, Floridians out there. Uh, it is important to evacuate. It's important to take this storm very, very seriously. It will be catastrophic. You heard from the FEMA administrator. She is headed uh, down to Florida uh, to uh, to be there with her team to assist uh, on the ground uh, as we are pre-positioning and preparing uh, for the storm. And just uh, back to the phone call with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Did the president at any point in this phone call, he said that it was constructive, uh, urge the prime minister to not take certain actions uh, as they relate to either the situation in Lebanon or potential retaliatory strikes against Iran? So look, I'm going to say what I said moments ago. Uh, this was a continued uh, uh, discussion on the leaders level, as you know, the staff level has been talking since last week, and it is certainly to continue to speak to the response on Iran's attack and a, and a, a, long, a, a long list of other, uh, other conversations and issues uh, that they wanted to discuss uh, between the two leaders. I don't have anything else to, to speak to or to say. There's going to be a readout shortly uh, that will have a little bit more uh, detail of that conversation. Uh, I'm just not going to get into specifics from here. Would it be safe to say that the president now has a clear understanding of and a clear picture of what Israel's plans are for retaliating against What I can Iran. tell you is they had a discussion. They continued their discussion on, um, uh, on a response to Iran's attack. Uh, a discussion last week, a discussion that certainly started at the staff level, and now the two leaders uh, were able to have a productive, uh, a straightforward, honest conversation, uh, as they tend to do. I don't have anything beyond that. Uh, thanks, Green. So Vice President Harris was also on that call between President Biden and <coughs> Yahoo. Can you just explain the role she played in that call? Did she just listen in? Did she weigh in on the issues as well? I, I would refer you to her team.
to speak and to that. Just going back to the contents of the call, I know there's a readout coming out yeah. soon, but can you just describe the tone of that call in terms of was the president continuing to push back on issues that were being presented to him from Netanyahu? It was di direct and it was productive. That's what I'll share. And can we say at this point if Israel has made a decision on how they want to respond? They continue to have a discussion on Israel's response uh, to the attack, to Iran's attack last week. Uh, I'm not going to go into specifics or details. There's going to be a readout shortly. Okay, Michael. Well, thanks, Corrine. Um, going back to your warnings against price gouging during the hurricanes, I'm just wondering, does the administration have any uh, reports that that's actually happening, or was this just intended to be a preemptory strike to keep it from happening? Uh, well, I think uh, certainly a preemptive, uh, a preemptive attempt to keep it from happening. Uh, we're keeping a close eye on prices uh, at the pump. Uh, at the airport, obviously, and also these hotel uh, counters to just make sure that it doesn't happen. Uh, we tend to see this type of behavior uh, during this time, uh, and we want to be very, very clear. Uh, it is not okay. It is not, it, there's no time to do that, uh, but certainly when people are uh, evacuating, when people are fearful uh, about, uh, about what's, what's, what's to come, uh, especially with the historic hurricane like Hurricane Milton, we want to make sure that this is not happening. Uh, and that's why the Department of Transportation is on top of it. You have DOJ, FTC, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, and so they're going to certainly uh, take actions here uh, and uh, to protect consumers. And that is what we want to make sure that we're doing. We're protecting consumers. We're protecting uh, Americans. Uh, and so that's our focus. Okay. Uh, thanks, Green. Going back to uh, the reporting in the, the Woodward book, yeah. uh, if former President Trump has been speaking to uh, President Putin, he's also had calls and meetings with other foreign leaders, uh, both uh, since he left office and since he announced his latest campaign for the presidency. Uh, is the administration at all concerned that he appears to be running a, a shadow foreign policy uh, while campaigning for president against yeah. the incumbent administration? And so, look, I'm going to give you the same answer that I give to Amr here, which is, uh, as we know, it's one president at a, at a time. That is how we do our business here uh, in this country, as you know very, very clearly. Um, look, and I said, if there was a, we cannot confirm this, if there was a call with President Putin, if that is indeed, indeed true, yeah, there are concerns, especially when you had the former president lobbying against Ukraine aid. Yeah, but I cannot confirm that. I cannot confirm those calls. What about his, uh, his meetings with foreign leaders, uh, such as Viktor Orban, who has opposed uh, aid to Ukraine as well? Uh, is, is look, I, look, I'm going to let the, f the former president speak to his uh, calls with world leaders. I'm not going to dive into that. Uh, but what I will say is uh, that this president uh, is focused at, at, at what's at hand, right? He had a conversation with the prime minister, 30 minutes, as I stated, half an hour. Uh, it was direct. It was uh, very much honest. Uh, it was to show uh, that, um, you know, uh, we're going to continue to have those discussions with Israel on how they're going to respond uh, after Iran's attack last week. Uh, you saw what this administration, what this president directed his military to do, uh, and our commitment uh, to Israel's security continues to be ironclad. That is what I can speak to, and that is what we're focused on. And as you know, we have a hurricane, uh, Milton, that's coming, and you heard from the president. So he has a lot to focus on, and that, and as a, as his le as a leader, that's what he's going to do. One more on the same topic. Sure. Uh, traditionally, when when former presidents do interface with uh, with foreign leaders, there there is uh, a process uh, by which they can liaise with the incumbent administration uh, to be uh, possibly briefed on any uh, any policy concerns and, and possibly uh, provide a readout of those conversations afterwards. Uh, has President has former President Trump availed himself of, of any resources that might be available to him? I don't have anything to speak to on that particular question, but I, I understand your question. I just don't have anything for you at this time. Okay. Thanks, Karin. One more try on the BB call. Sorry. Sure. Um, do, did the president during this conversation address the latest comments uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu made saying that uh, Lebanon could uh, experience the same level of destruction as Gaza if they don't free themselves from Hezbollah? So look, um, as I stated, um, 
they had a productive and honest conversation. Uh, but what I will say very clearly about that particular question is we, uh, we cannot and will not uh, see Lebanon turn into Gaza, into another Gaza. Uh, that is not what we want to see. Uh, the suffering in both Gaza and Lebanon uh, adds even greater urgency, uh, as you've heard from us, uh, to our efforts uh, certainly to end the conflicts and lay a foundation for lasting peace and security in the region. Uh, for over a year, if you think about what has occurred for over a year, you've seen Hezbollah uh, has attacked Israel and rejected all off-ramps uh, to this conflict. That's what you've seen. Uh, the suffering we are seeing in Lebanon uh, could have been avoided, could have been avoided if, if Hezbollah would have stopped its rockets uh, attacks on Israel. So look, um, I'm going to just reiterate what our position is when it comes to Lebanon. Uh, we are working our way back. Uh, towards a ceasefire process uh, that's going to create a space to negotiate on a diplomatic resolution that only ends the fighting. That's what we're going to continue to do and allow civilians from both sides uh, of the blue line to return uh, to return home. Uh, and we want to see that be done safely uh, and certainly uh, with security as well. And so that's what our focus is going to be on. Okay. Thank you, Corinne. I've no, got no. a. <laughs> I keep trying to call her. <laughs> Let me let her go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. So more on the on the Middle East. Yeah. At this point, does the White House understand that Israel is planning to attack energy facilities in Iran? So we've spoken to that, uh, and uh, look, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. I'm not going to get that in, get into that from here. Uh, that has been asked uh, of the president. That has been asked of us last week. What I can say is that we've had discussions, we're continuing discussions with Israel on their response to, to Iran's attack last week. Uh, I'm not going to dive into it. I'm not going to get into it uh, from here. Uh, and so you saw that happening on the staff level, and now what you saw today was that happening on the leaders level. I'm not going to get into hypotheticals or speculations from here. And how would you describe right now the relationship between the president and Netanyahu? I, I mean, look, they've known each other for decades. They've known each other for decades. And because of that, they're able to have that frank conversation. Uh, because of that, the president's able to be honest, and they're both able to be honest to each other. Uh, and I think what, what I can report to you, and I've said this multiple times already, the conversation that they had today was productive. Uh, and it was direct, very much in line with many other conversations that they have had, not just in the past year, but over decades. Uh, and I think you've heard the president speak directly uh, about his relationship with the prime minister. Uh, and so they've known each other for a long time. They've had a decades-long friendship. Uh, and I think, uh, I think that's, that, says, that says it all for me. Go ahead, Mandy. Thank you. I will say in the Middle East, you said that the administration will continue evacuating U.S. citizens from Lebanon as long as the airport is open. Do you have any guarantee that Israel is not bombing the airport? Say that one more time. The last part, I didn't have, hear that. Does the White House have any guarantee that Israel will not bomb Beirut airport? So look, we're going to have very direct uh, conversations with the government of Israel. Uh, about the shape and the nature as we speak about Lebanon specifically, right? Uh, and the ultimate sc scope of their campaign. Uh, and uh, those conversations are going to continue. Uh, and I'm not going to get into specific conversations that we're having, but it will be, it will continue to be very direct. Uh, and, uh, and that's what you've seen uh, over the past year, and that's what's going to continue. You also said that are you working towards a ceasefire and a diplomatic solution as yeah. the best outcome to the crisis. So what, how exactly will this materialize? Considering Israel has rejected a ceasefire, a diplomatic solution, and Hezbollah leaders have been killed one after the other. So who are you talking to when you talk about ceasefire? Uh, look, we want to see, as the president has said, we want to reach a ceasefire deal. That's what we want to see. And again, to provide space uh, for that diplomatic uh, resolution, those diplomatic conversations. And we want to see civilians on both sides to return uh, back home. Uh, uh, and uh, on both sides of the border, obviously. And so those discussions continue. We have been very clear that those conversations have been continuing for some time now. Uh, and uh, ultimately, ultimately, we need a diplomatic uh, resolution. We understand that. We have to have a diplomatic resolution, and that's the only way to achieve that long-lasting uh, stability. 
right, when you think about security uh, across the Israel, Israel uh, and Lebanon uh, uh, border. And so that's what we want to see. It doesn't stop us uh, from having those conversations to having those discussions. Today, you heard from me, you heard uh, from, from us that the two leaders spoke uh, about an array of issues. Uh, they continued that discussion uh, about uh, how, they're, how Israel's gonna respond to Iran's attack from last week and a, a bunch of other things that are incredibly important uh, to both leaders. We'll have a readout shortly uh, that we'll share a little bit more. And one last question. Um, in two weeks, there is already eight hospitals in Lebanon are out of service. There is thousands of being, people being killed. Mm -hmm. There is one million forced to flee their homes. And yeah. the Israelis has calling for more troops. So how can this not be a scenario in Gaza that we have seen it unfolding? And second is, isn't that a mission creep? How do you agree with the Israelis on the outcome of the war? If Netanyahu said, we're going to continue regardless of what the White House, more or less, is saying, as long as we are not achieving our our uh, aims in the look. Uh, look, I'm going to uh, say what I said moments ago. We do not want to see Gaza, what happened in Gaza, happen in Lebanon. I, that's what I said, and that is something that we do not want to see. Uh, and as we've said, Israel does have the right to defend itself, uh, and. Um, you know, to go after their 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 uh, their security threats that they see, uh, but um, one civilian casualty is too many, and we've been very clear about that. Uh, they must take Israel must take uh, every feasible precaution to prevent civilian harm, and those are the conversation discussions that we're going to continue to have. Uh, and um, look. You heard from us, we announced some human humanitarian assistance uh, for Lebanon for the challenges that they're dealing with, uh, $157 million. We announced that last week uh, to deal with those, uh, to those humanitarian challenges. And so we're aware of what's going on, uh, and we've been very clear. We've been very clear on this. Okay, Jared. Uh, just two kind of clarifying questions, at least clarifying for me, uh, they may be clear for others. But um, have you, uh, in the talks that the president has had with, with uh, the Israeli prime minister, sort of beyond just kind of the details or the readout, mm -hmm. is there now an expectation that Israel would inform the administration in advance of action it's planning to take against Iran? What I can tell you that the discussions continue and how Israel's going to respond to that attack, to the attack from Iran last week. Those discussions continue. I'm not going to get into details from here. And then just uh, quickly on, on the uh, Lebanon, it, you talked about kind of the, the efforts being made to help Americans uh, get out. Yeah, uh, Americans so far, who are, are in all, Lebanon. Are those all commercial flights at this point? Or are you talking about like some military charters or diplomatic charters as well? Yeah, so um, what I spoke to was uh, 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 commercial flights and what we're trying to do, uh, get some seats on, uh, certainly on these flights. Uh, I would refer you to the State Department. Uh, they did a very well, a very good lay down of this as well, uh, and they're certainly helping to lead that effort. So I would refer you to the State Department on any specifics. Go ahead, Phil. Um, thank you, Corrine. Yeah. Uh, you're pretty consistent. You don't often speculate about hypotheticals, but today on more than one occasion, you've said that if it's true, that former President Trump spoke with Vladimir Putin, then that's concerning. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, why is this administration willing to speculate about that in particular? I said, if it's true. Speculation. It's speculation, but if it's true, because I knew, right, we all knew that you all will have, will have questions about, uh, uh, for us, about the national security concerns, uh, about our thoughts about this. And so, if it is indeed true, Right? We're talking about President Putin here. We see what's happening in Ukraine, Russia's aggression in Ukraine. That's about democracy. That's about Ukrainians fighting for their freedom. And we've heard the former president say and lobby against the, the funding uh, for Ukraine. So yeah, if it is true, uh, it is indeed concerning because we're talking about our national security here. So we want it to be, I want it to be very, very clear. Uh, and so I'll leave it there. And then a second question. Sure. Um, does President Biden regret making Merrick Garland his attorney general, as uh, Mr. Woodward has reported? Uh, look, um, the reason I'm able to speculate, because that's a national security concern, I wanted to be very clear about that. But as I've stated many times before, there's going to be many books uh, written about an administration. It's, not, it's very much typical 
uh, and I'm just not going to comment on every specifics, every uh, every uh, matter that comes up or any particulars uh, that come up. And then a national security question. Yeah. Um, Mr. Woodward also reports that according to intelligence reports, White House f officials here believed that there was as much of a 50% chance that Russia would use a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine. I mean, is, is that 50% odds <laughs> number? Is that accurate? And if so, yeah. uh, would this administration you know, let the American public know that that kind of risk is real? Again, I'm not going to speak to everything uh, that is in a book, every particular. Uh, there's going to be many books written, and we understand that. It's not atypical, uh, but I won't respond to every piece in a book. All right, guys, got to go. Thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow.